So thank you everybody for being here, depending on where you are quite early in the morning for me. <laughs> uh, I think this is going to be a great session. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today. I'm David Ivney, part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers during COVID-19 team. I'll be moderating today's session, uh, but before we get too far in, uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. Uh, their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them, the Cree Nation, the Métis, the Diné, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all of the nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to this land. Once again, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples where I am right now. A few technical notes as we start in. Uh, to keep noise disturbances at a low, we ask you, that you remain muted until called upon during the Q&A or discussion. Uh, the chat feature, however, is available throughout the presentation for you to engage. Feel free to introduce yourselves, where you hail from, um, and during the Q&A slash discussion time, I will be reading questions from the chat into the session, so um, that chat function will be a sort of vital part of keeping this discussion going. Uh, we are going to be recording this session, so you are free to ask questions with your camera off if you would like to not be part of the video recording. Similarly, if you do not wish to be in the audio recording, again, you can put your questions in the chat and I'll be reading them into the session. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be translated into Spanish and uh, be made available to disseminate further. Uh, the Spanish version of the tip line webinar from last month uh, is available on the ETFW website. I have the link in the chat there. Uh, and while we're talking about ETFW webinars, uh, I have the link to register for our November 17th webinar here. Um, and I will be reposting these um, later on as well. Uh, the webinar on the 17th is about our airport support services, uh, both Kairos's airport support services, but also the support services in the airports for temporary foreign workers available um, in uh, Western Canada as well. We have members of the ETFW team here today. So we have uh, Connie, Mitos, and Essel, and Jalen, I believe as well. Uh, and we have Shannon here from Kairos. Um, so this is the team from that is supporting the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Program, and we are happy to uh, be presenting this webinar today. Uh, as we move into the session, uh, this webinar will focus on the Open Work Permit for Vulnerable Workers, examining the purpose of the Open Work Permit uh, itself, uh, the process of application for the permit, the evidence needed to apply, and support, supports available to workers through that process. 
Our guest speakers, many of whom are partners in the ETFW project, uh, will also talk about their experiences engaging with the program. Uh, we had hoped to have uh, representatives from Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada uh, available. Uh, unfortunately, they were unable to send anyone. However, throughout the session, I will be taking notes of important questions uh, and concerns to bring forward to you, IRCC and Service Canada, uh, in hopes of continuing a conversation about the OWP program and any gaps and challenges experienced using it. Um, to move into our first speaker today, um, who is going to walk through the Open Work Permit program. Uh, Francie Munoz has been working at the Windsor Essex Bilingual Legal Clinic for 13 years as community legal worker. She speaks Spanish and has a law degree and a master's degree in administrative law from her home country, Colombia. Uh, studied the paralegal and the language interpreter program at St. Clair College and is currently a candidate awaiting her call to the Bar of Ontario. Since January uh, 2017, she has successfully led the Care for International Workers program and the Spanish-speaking clients program at the legal clinic in Windsor, Essex County. Francie is a high-profile advocate for international workers' safety, education, and wellness in Windsor, Essex. Thank you for agreeing to speak with us today, Francie. Thanks you for the introduction. <laughs> it was um, too much <laughs> talking about me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Hey, hey, I'm having some evening. trouble hearing here this webinar that I'm supposed to be watching. Oh. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Is everything okay? Can I continue? Yep, you can go ahead, Fred. Okay. Okay, yeah. I say good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Uh, the Bilingual Legal Clinic of Windsor Access is a non-profit community clinic. We are funded by Legal in Ontario and we serve people with low incomes living in the region in Windsor and Essex County. Uh, we deal with many matters, employment law, immigration law, housing law, social benefits, a small claims score, just a few of them. <laughs> I'm going to talk today about the um, legal requirements to apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers. So we are going to start. Next slide, the slides, please. Okay. Thank you. So this presentation uh, doesn't replace the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act and its regulations and should not be used as a legal advice. It's just for general information, no solicitor-client relationship arise as a result of accessing to this presentation. And for information and advice, particular to your situation, you should seek legal advice from an experienced lawyer in your jurisdiction. Next, please. Thank you. So uh, there are two kinds of work permits in Canada. One is the employer-specific work permit, or is called also the closed work permit. Uh, these are specific work permits that allow workers to work accordingly to the conditions of the work permits. So workers can only work for a specific employer for a specific period of time and for a specific occupation and for a specific location. So everything is inside. Uh, the workers can check the work permit and see what are the requirements and conditions that are applicable for them. So workers cannot apply for to extend their work permit under the seasonal agricultural work program. So if the employer, for example, they want to rehire the worker, those workers must go back to their countries before they can apply for another work permit. Under the agricultural stream, the other stream, workers cannot apply for an extension. If workers want to change job or employers, they must apply for a new work permit from inside Canada. So to change the employers, workers must apply to change the conditions of the work permit. And the employer must give workers a new job offer letter, a new LMII number, and a new contract signed by the worker and the future employer. There is also in Canada another option available recently uh, for the workers is the um, International Experience Canada. It's a particular category. So 
work permit if they if just is, is if they are working for the same employer at the same location and their job duties won't change. So people under this close work permit can be eligible for a work permit under one or more of international experience Canadian only if it's a foreign uh, job. If it's eligible, if it's between 18 and 35 years old, if it has a profile with the IEC pool, and if, for example, you have received invitation to apply for this project, for this program, sorry, or for example, if it's part of the international mobile program, this is the another, it's a different option, it's a new option available recently. So there is another category, and another kind of work permit is the open work permit. Mm -hmm. This permit allow workers to work for any employer in Canada, and generally people who obtain an open work permit have some other type of status. For example, eh, those that are coming to Canada and they are protected by a person, or is they pass the fear, first stage of approval of the humanitarian and compassionate grounds, or the refugee claimants, or permanent residents or citizens, they, usually they have an open work permit. Uh, with an open work permit, uh, uh, workers can extend or change the conditions of the work permit. Obviously, they have to apply. The work permit uh, is just a permit. It's, it doesn't confer any temporary resident status. It's just a permit. Next one, please. Thank you. The program, the open work permit for vulnerable workers. Uh, this program starts in June 4, 2019 and section 207.1 of the IR, IRPR gives um, the IRCC the authority to issue uh, the open work permit for temporary workers for those workers that hold in uh, and had an, an specific work permit and are experiencing any kind of abuse or who are in risk of abuse uh, in the context of their employment, they can apply for, for this kind of category or program of open work permit for vulnerable workers program. So migrant working in Canada, in summary, those who are experienced abuse or who are in risk of abuse in the context of their employment in Canada, they may be eligible uh, to receive an open work permit that is exempt from the labor market impact assessment LMII process. Next one, please. So now we are going to talk about the requirements. What are the requirements to apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers? So uh, the, the worker has to be in Canada, must be in Canada working here. Uh, the temporary foreign worker must hold a valid employer specific work permit or have submitted a work permit extension application for the same employer and is currently in Canada under an employer status. What is the employer status? That means the temporary foreign worker is precluded from applying in the individual if the individual has already lost the status, but they still have 90 days for restoration for restoration of the period. So if, if they just has um that means they don't have um they finish the, the work permit finished, that means it, it expired and they have 90 days to apply for restoration of that work permit. That's fine. What is restoration? Restoration means that uh, this, there is a period, this 90 days period, when the worker can find a, a job, uh, show the uh, of the letter of employment, show the LMII, and in that period, just get and apply the, um, the, the work permit. The temporary foreign worker uh, also has to be experienced. The work permit is the the open work permit also. Okay, there is a question there. Uh, we are going to answer now or later? Uh, if you if you can speak to it, uh, you okay. can. You're free to answer it. We can also save it for the question and answer period, depending on what you're looking for. Okay. Um, has to be for the. I mean, if they. Employer just um, has a work permit and the work permit uh, expired and they need to apply. Obviously, they need to apply before, at least one month before for, for the, send the application. But if the worker um, 
it's, it's just a period of time. So the worker expire the work permit, they apply, and they cannot return widely because there is an implied status. It's 90 days that the, that the immigration offices gave to the workers to restore this, their status. Restore their status means is they have to apply before expire, before the expire the work permit, and they have 90 days to uh, get the formal requirements and get the, you know, the LAM, the LMII, the offer of employment, sign the contract. As soon as they have that, they can just restore the status and start working. So the application has to be before the, the work permit expires. Uh, what is, oh yeah, and the other requirement for apply is the temporary foreign worker um, has been experienced abuse or in risk of experience abuse in the context of the employee. The second slide. Yeah. Uh, next one, please, David, thank you. Okay, this is the eligibility. So to be eligible, Workers must be in a status, have a valid open work permit that require the LMI. It's the thing I mentioned before, they have to have a, a valid uh, work permit uh, or they have a valid closed work, work permit that is exempt of LMI or, the, um, or be authorized to work without a work permit on the, the implied status. Um, there is no fees for this application. This application is free. And the length of the uh, of the permit is up to the officer. Usually, um, the officer confer one year. It usually, is one year of 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 the duration of this kind of open work permit. Next one, please. Thank you. So, what is abuse? So, abuse can be a any kind of the categories of the abuse. So, physical abuse uh, that includes, for example. For example, assault uh, also includes forcible confinement or can be sexual abuse when includes sexual contact without consent, uh, psychological abuse, including threats and intimidation, or financial abuse, include fraud and extortion or no paying wages owed to the worker, or for example, it's, uh, stealing some of the monies or uh, taking a worker's money, salary, or checks or coercing them into giving them up. This is our kinds of abuse. Next one, please. Thank you. Okay, there, is, there are here uh, some examples of the abuse, of the risk of abuse that a worker can experience. So for example, the employer or the recruiter or both have coerced the migrant worker into paying job placement and recruiter fees. So they, they already just mm, say, no, you have to pay because you are here. I pay you to come to Canada. You have to, to pay for your trip or, you know, for your train or for your flight or for any, any way they, the worker came to Canada. So the employer, for example, in several locations, doesn't pay the wages uh, away to the migrant worker. This is a, a kind of abuse uh, in, on temporary foreign workers. Uh, the migrant worker on several locations, for example, harass the worker and they, they feel the worker uncomfortable, for example, unwanted physical or verbal behavior that is offending the worker or is humiliating the worker and in the context of the workplace. Another kind of abuse, for example, when the migrant worker is treated by the employer, if they complain about their rights or, or if they approach a legal clinic or something like that, this is, a, what, this is a kind of abuse. Uh, another, for example, forcing or pressuring the migrant worker to perform a work that contravenes the conditions of the work permit. For example, uh, they say, mm, you have to work in a different uh, place with a different employer. Uh, I'm going to split you in a different region or you are going to do this kind of job that is, is usually is different, of course, that is mm, in the work permit for the activities that they have in the work permit. So this is a, a form of course, in, engagement in legal activity, or maybe, you know, these trips maybe uh, also cause a, another kind of claims like, um, like human rights um, claims or something like that for discrimination or harassment or treatment. So everything is connected. 
uh, when the employer is forcing the worker, there are a lot of areas of law involved. Uh, on another way, another um, kind of abuse is, for example, in insulting, intimidating the worker, humiliating the worker, harassing the worker, threatening the worker, including, for example, uh, make comments or um, comments unrespectful about the immigration status or just treating the worker with deportation or name calling the worker or yelling the worker or just, yeah, com comments about the nationality or the color of the worker or something like that. So also it's abuse and blaming the worker, uh, shaming, ridiculing, disrespectful, criticizing a worker situation. Uh, is also abuse when the other co-workers participate in this kind of abuse or harassment or discrimination or just mm, love all the time about the, the worker or say, for example, uh, you are not doing a good job in, in your country, you are very lazy or something like that. That kind of comments are abuse and putting them, uh, the workers at risk or experience an abuse situation in the employer. Um, next, please. Okay. Um, we couldn't notice, even now, I couldn't notice at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a lot of forms of abuse in the context of COVID-19 uh, related to the working and living conditions of the migrant workers. For example, I'm going to mention what uh, examples we experienced as a legal clinic uh, during the covid 19 so, For example, the employer, uh, didn't provide wages over to during the mandatory quarantine or isolation period uh, during the entry to Canada. For example, the migrant worker was forced or, or pressured to perform work that violates the conditions of mandatory quarantine or isolation period. Uh, for example, um, the worker is, it was forced, forced to work uh, when showing symptoms of COVID-19 or forced to work with co-workers who should be in quarantine or who, are, who were asymptomatic. Symptomatic, sorry. Uh, so usually I know they were at the beginning, uh, farms where they mix the workers, so the workers with COVID mixed with the workers that didn't have COVID. So we noticed that kind of, of abuse during COVID-19. We had a lot of claims uh, for that situation. Uh, also, it's an, it was it's an abuse. Uh, not in the context of COVID-19, uh, when the migrant worker is, is prevented from seeking, seeking medical assistance. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the employer just confined the worker into the workplace and just say, no, you cannot stay here, you cannot go inside, you, can, you cannot go find a doctor, or you cannot uh, find a health unit, or anything. So this is a, a, that's a kind of restriction to the workers. Um, for example, the worker um, during the pandemic yeah, is not provided with uh, adequate tools or working conditions to implement the public health and social distance protections. We receive a lot of claims from workers that didn't receive any PPE protection, uh, even, even nothing, even the basic things now, the masks, the sanitizer, uh, the wipes, the it, 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 this, this is not common now because most of people are educated about what are the measures, the distant measures, the COVID-19 protections. But at the beginning of the pandemic, this was crazy. And yeah, we had a lot of claims with these kind of situations. Also, um, it's an abuse in the context of COVID-19, the reprisal sanctions against a worker for taking sick leave or refusing to work in unsafe working conditions. Uh, also, the employer doesn't provide uh, adequate um, accommodations for the quarantine or cell isolation uh, to just avoid the spread of the, of the virus. Uh, also, it's a, it was an abuse failing to provide workers with, with cleaning products to prevent the spread in the shared accommodations. Uh, even now, I have um, uh, a few weeks ago, I had a presentation about housing conditions, the standard of housing conditions. And some of the workers mentioned that even now they don't, the, the employers didn't provide them any sanitizer or any mask. They have just to go and just find by themselves the products. So 
Oh, is it still happening? Yeah. Uh, also, um, the employer prevents the worker from obtaining essential items during their quarantine or isolation period. For example, the groceries, medication, or fails to provide adequate um, uh, alternate arrangements. For example, assisting the, the worker to pick up or to deliver the food. Do you remember at the beginning of the COVID when the workers were not allowed to go outside to buy groceries and the supervisors just replied that, that that job and go to find the, the groceries for the workers. It, it wasn't at the beginning also the, when the pandemic, when the, the worker prevent, the employer, sorry, the employer prevent the worker to pick up the food or just to go or just to order, order just a, a food in any restaurant. This happened before, maybe not now, because I wanna make sure everybody is just educated more now about COVID. Um, next slide, please. David, thank you. So how to apply? Uh, workers can apply directly to Immigration, Refugee and Cities in Canada, uh, the IRCC, for an open work permit for vulnerable workers by filing out the application online. Uh, workers uh, has to include in the, have to include in the application online supporting evidence of the abuse if applicable. For example, they can uh, just attach a description of the abuse of risk of abuse faced by the migrant worker. They can attach a letter. They can attach a statement or report from the abuse support organization, for example, a medical doctor, um, you know, the healthcare professional or another uh, health en entity, that kind of entity. Um, the letter can be uh, an affidavit or the, um, or the letter can be just the, um, if there is a, for example, in our office, because we're a legal clinic, uh, we provide a cover letter or, and we attach with the supporting documents. So it's just, or it's a letter from the, from the worker who is experienced the abuse and in handwriting with um, the signature on the bottom, uh, everything counts. So if you have more supporting evidence, always is better. So also um, the employer, uh, the employer, sorry, the worker has to show a, um, an affidavit is usually is better if the worker can get an affidavit uh, and be um, an attached to the to the application form online. Uh, the most important in my experience as a legal clinic is the copy of an official complaint uh, form filed by with an enforcing agency, for example, enforcement agency like the I, for example, um, depends on the circumstances, but usually the workers uh, has to complain. That means the requirement is, is better if the worker has to uh, has something to show, uh, a complaint because of the discrimination or harassment or the employment abuse or whatever. So they can uh, attach to the application for a police report or a Canadian Border Service Agency report or a copy of the official complaint um, submitted to a provincial enforcement, enforcement agency, for example, uh, for the um, some workers in my experience, we usually experience, um, in my experience, I noticed that the workers, most of the workers, I think is the, the generality, around 800 <laughs> workers that I have uh, in the clinic, uh, they are victims of harassment and discrimination in the workplace. So what we usually do is we file a um, complaint uh, before the, the tribunal, the Human Rights Tribunal in Ontario, and we get that um, acknowledge and the receive and the, yeah, something, a document pro proving that the worker just complained before the tribunal. We use that acknowledgement and we use that um, information from the, from the tribunal in order to apply uh, to support the documentation that we are going to use in the application for open work permit. Uh, we also have some workers that have reported to the police, so we can use that report uh, and use it as a supporting document for the open work permit application. Uh, also, the, um, any complaint to the Ministry of Labor, so we can just attach that information to the application. So it's the most important thing in my experience is just to file uh, the complaint 
from the emerging uh, force agency as a supporting document for the open world project. Now, uh, I know the deadline also is a good way just to, to show that the, the worker complained before in advance, you know, before to start the application. Um, another supporting materials that are really important to attach are, for example, the victim impact statement, uh, hard copies of any email messages, any photos showing injuries or working conditions or witness testimonies, um, can be testimonies, affidavits by a commissioner from the witnesses or can be just a handwriting uh, of the witnesses supporting the um, application of the of the worker that is victim of abuse. Next one, please. Okay, uh, here is, there is a list of resources available for migrant workers. So you can contact uh, any of these agencies at the phone numbers that appear here in the list, but I know there are more resources that we can provide you, for, provide you. for example, Kairos has a list of resources. The, the government of Canada has a list of resources where the workers can go and are available for migrant workers. So this is just a, a list. So if the worker needs assistance or for free or needs some advice, uh, can contact my clinic, the Windsor Essex Bilingual Legal Clinic. Uh, the, the phone numbers are on the slide. So feel free to access to us or any of the agencies that available to support the workers. So thank you so much. I think this is the last slide. Yes, the last. Thank you so much. So do you have some questions? Still muted. Hello. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Francie, for that. Uh, I've learned quite a bit, um, and I think it would be good to have a few, take a few questions before moving on to uh, partners and experiences with the program itself. So I see Aswani already has a hand up, which is great. Um, you can go ahead. Okay, Hi. thank you so much. Hi, Aswani. Hi, nice to you. see you. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it's always a pleasure to see you and hear you, you. Uh, helping us with to learn more about how can we support uh, migrant workers. I'm really happy that uh, mm -hmm. for your presentation. I have a couple of questions, Francie. Um, I have since I started with the program and participating. I have been involved in sometimes helping migrant workers with open work permits. I haven't done it myself because, uh, to be honest, for me it just seems a bit overwhelmed. Uh, one question is that. If we as organizations, um, we start helping and trying to help and do the open work permit for workers, does it have the same, I don't know, um, legitim how do you say leg 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 legitimate or is believable or because we don't, we are not um, legal clinics, maybe they will know that will impact the application. That's one question. Okay, about that, uh, any worker that is experiencing abuse can apply uh, by their cells. They don't need a lawyer just to file the application. It's a, an application online. As soon as uh, the worker or the agency that is supporting, even if it's not a legal clinic, uh, the, uh, the organization or the community uh, agency has to provide the supporting documents uh, for the application. So doesn't require uh, a legal a lawyer just to file a, the application or to help the, the worker. The community uh, organizations can help the workers without any problem, just uh, get the information, as much evidence you can, the pictures, uh, testimonies, videos, um, the affidavit or the handwriting. Usually, you know what, uh, we are a legal clinic, but in most of um, my cases, I never use an affidavit. Just I use the handwriting of the workers. They put the signature on the bottom and also the witnesses, and this is enough. Plus, obviously, the complaint uh, with the enforcement agency, you know, the complaint from Human Rights Tribunal or the employment, the, the Ministry of Labor or the police report. That everything counts. Um, always, if you, 
even to be successful in the application. Thank you. I was wondering if maybe you can have a workshop or like teach us how to do it, but that's just a comment. That's not a question. Mm -hmm. And my other question is, um, so I have been in situations where workers, they leave their work because it's, they are in abusive situation. So they left and they started the application in the 90 days, but I have noticed that some, like some places that they are uh, opening up to workers are taking longer than that period. Um, what happened in that case? What happened when they already passed those 19 days, even though they start applying, but it has not been processed? Uh, they cannot stay more than 90 days if they don't have a real situation fixed. That means uh, if during the 90 days they didn't find the LMII of the, um, of the official letter offer, <laughs> you know, the offer of employment, official formal document or sign the contract, they have to return to their countries. So there are no more than 90 days for them. So if they couldn't find, sometimes happens that they apply before an employer promised them to offer a job and they say, no, you can stay. You can just put the signature here. This is the contract, uh, stay, don't go wait. And the workers just believe, rely on the, on the words of the employer and stay. So if after the 90 days, the worker didn't get the offer, the offer letter or the LMI, they immediately has to return to their countries because they cannot violate the immigration uh, deadline that put in the, in the work permit with the employee status. So, cannot... um, so to just to clarify that, so if they are still in the process, it doesn't, if it hasn't, happen because they are still like getting in the process and it's been taking some time because um, sometimes this process seems a bit lengthy for some uh, some some places that are helping them. So that means that they have to return after those 19 days, even yes. though it has not even processed. Yes, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable period, 90 days is a reasonable period to fix uh, a situation with the employer. So if they don't get the situation ready on solve it before the 90 days, they have to return to their countries. Yeah, this is a requirement. Okay, thank you. We're gonna, thank you so much for that. Uh, those questions. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Vilma. Hi, thank you. And my question is that because most of the workers really uh, do not want to file a complaint to any uh, Ontario Labor Board or Ministry of uh, uh, Labor. And most of the times uh, it's so frustrating for them because they are actually uh, experiencing abuse, but uh, they're scared of filing a complaint. And in my cases, uh, I have uh, filed complaint uh, Ontario, to the Ontario Labor Board and to the Ministry of Labor. And most of my uh, applications are being um, uh, approved because I have the proof, uh, the proof that uh, I filed cases. But in, in most instances, uh, I'm not getting any approval, especially if I only provide them uh, affidavit. Um, just one of my clients is here um, and uh, he lost his status during the application during the summertime in July. We, I uploaded all the, uh, uh, the documents, the uh, affidavit, the uh, complaint from the uh, Ontario Labor Board, and all the pictures, medical report, everything that, that is very vital for the application. Up until now, uh, uh, he's not getting any result. And he lost his status during those times. And he, he already passed that uh, 90 days. What the good thing is, uh, he just told me just recently, uh, uh, last night or two, two nights ago, that the regular work permit that was applied before the application was approved. So last night, I uploaded it in the web form. But, you know, web form, it takes forever before uh, I can get a response. I went to the GCK account, and I don't see any... Uh, a letter from IRCC saying that they received a web form uh, uploading uh, the documents uh, for the new work permit. I also have one client in Alberta that uh, she, uh, I tried to apply for open work permit for her, but um, un unfortunately, 
uh, she had a first employer and the first employer charged her with a sexual assault for the child that she's looking after. And then she didn't know that. And then she looked for another job and found an employer with LMIA. And then this employer, the second employer sexually harassed her. So I tried to apply for work permit. And then that's when the time we found out that the first employer before she left filed a, a sexual assault to the child that she's looking after. When I called IRCC about the open work permit that we're applying, IRCC said, you cannot apply for open work for her because of the criminal case. She has to uh, uh, face the issue first and then that's the only time that uh, she can file. But she was sexually harassed also by the second employer. And because of that, she can no longer, uh, her mobility is being you know, uh, limited because she has a problem with the first employer and then she, she's sexually harassed by the second employer. And now she don't have any status and now she's hiding and she don't have anybody in, in, in Alberta. But she has a, so in these cases, what are we going to do with these workers? One of the uh, client is here and he can testify that his work permit since July is still out there waiting for approval. And last night I just uploaded two open work permit applications because one I applied for, I complained at the uh, Ontario Labor Board and one is at the uh, Ministry of Labor because it depends on what type of uh, complaint there are. Uh, experiencing in the workplace. So I'm still waiting for another uh, approval. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, those cases that you have uh, has to be um, evaluated according to the criteria of the Immigration Office to assess the application that you already filed. Uh, I, con I cannot give you any answer about why they didn't accept or why they are not processing your application because this is um, this is the discretionality of the immigration officers to assess your cases, uh, but for sure, um, if you need to know more or you need to tell more to me, or because we need to keep the confidentiality of the cases and the clients, and I cannot uh, give you any advice here. <laughs> Uh, but for sure I can help you if you need uh, any advice or I can just guide you how to do it or uh, I need to know more about the cases, about the particular situation of the client. Every client is different. Every client has a different story, a different situation and a different result from the immigration application. So uh, I really um, want to offer my help if you maybe later or in another me meeting in a confidentiality way, we can just talk about the cases uh, specifically and particular uh, for the clients or cases that you already have. Thanks. Actually, Ms. Francie, uh, these are, if, this is a group of uh, workers, 15 of them, uh, uh, 11 in one farm and four in a different farm. And those 11, 10 already was approved. Only this one was not approved, but uh, they already had the first hearing uh, on the uh, Ontario Labor Board. And they're going to have another uh, hearing uh, for the uh, cases that uh, were filed. Yeah, uh, so the immigration, the immigration office or the immigration officers, they have discretionality to assess the open work permits and review the supporting documents that you are filing in the application. So it's discretion of them uh, to know if the application has enough merit or there are more evidence that need to be submitted. So it depends of them, of what the immigration office criteria have been using to evaluate your situation. So Connie, Connie <laughs> is there and wants to speak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Francie. Uh, I just want to say that when we plan to have this uh, webinar, we invited IRCC and also ESDC to be present. Uh, we did a tip uh, utilization of tip line, utilizing the tip line uh, webinar with ESDC, and 
we uh, we see the connection, right, uh, between filing a complaint, uh, being in an abusive environment and situation, and um, applying for an open work permit. So, but um, there is a disconnect between what IRCC is doing and also what the tip line is doing. Um, and we wanted to address that by having this webinar and having them around. And fortunately, they're not able to, to come uh, to join this webinar. And IRCC is actually suggesting, you know, to move, you know, the date of this webinar so that they can participate. Of course, we cannot do that. Uh, but here's what, um, here's my suggestion. Uh, Vilma, for the cases that you, that you mentioned, uh, this is something that we can bring up to ESDC in terms of, you know, why the, the 10 were approved and uh, the same case, the same location, the same, uh, the same complaints and the other one, the, 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 the last application or one of the applications not. So it's a good question to bring up. Um, I understand that IRCC officers have discretionary powers. And, and oftentimes, you know, the, the, the ability to question or to appeal that decision is not always, uh, uh, it's not always open or it's not always disclosed. So it, it behooves, you know, for the worker to find ways on how to appeal the decision. But um, this is something that, you know, uh, we can bring up. I always uh, share and said at partners meeting that if you have cases, that if you are working on cases related to the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers uh, project, bring it up to us because we have this regular consultation and check in with the SDC and we bring cases to them and they do their due diligence and also connecting with different government agencies to find out what's happening and how they can support, you know, and, and give clarity in terms of uh, the action taken or no action taken. So just to, yeah, just to bring that back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connie. Um, before we get into further discussion, I know there's much we can talk about here. Uh, I want to move into um, hearing from some of our uh, guest speakers in terms of uh, their experiences with, um, with the process of application and supporting workers um, through that. So uh, to start, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel Lake uh, with Waterloo Region Community Legal Services. Uh, she's been there for seven years. Uh, she practices immigration as well as EI and disability law and speaks French and Spanish. Uh, and I am so grateful that uh, she has agreed to speak today. So uh, please take it away, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. <clears throat> um, so a lot of what I had prepared to say has been very thoroughly covered by Francie, um, but I think it serves to um, just amplify um, what she said and underline the importance of um, of certain, including certain things with uh, uh, your open work permit application for your vulnerable workers. Um, so as David said, I'm a staff lawyer at Waterloo Region Community Legal Services. Um, we have some temporary foreign workers in our catchment area. Um, so our catchment area includes uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, but then the, the surrounding townships. Um, and a lot of the surrounding townships is farmland. Um, there are a lot of Mennonite farms, but there is a lot of farmland that is owned by folks who are not um, Mennonite. Um, and then, but the temporary, the group of temporary foreign workers that I connected with aren't um, specifically farm workers, but they work in the agricultural field. Um, <clears throat> so I, over the past 10 months, um, I mean, I connected with the group of, of workers um, last summer, so around July of 2020, um, and then I submitted my first application with the first individual, not until December. Um, and so I think that that might highlight um, for some folks 
um, the hesitation that some workers experience um, going into this. Um, they are um, they are afraid of submitting um, these applications. Um, and in the situation uh, for, for the workers that I've been working with, um, a lot of them are, are extended family members of the owner of the corporation. So there is some added um, complications, some added complexities for those workers because um, you know, making a complaint against the owner of the company um, is also making a complaint against a member of their, their extended family. Um, and so any, um, you know, the result of the application could be jeopardizing the familial relationships. Um, so that is something that I certainly speak to in the application. Um, so I'm not sure why this is not advancing, but um, okay. So um, these are just uh, some of my tips um, that, uh, that I'm going to share. Um, I, I guess um, for all of, of the applications that I've submitted, um, mine were all approved very quickly, like within a week. Um, but I think that that might be because there, for most of the applications, I think four out of the five applications that I submitted, the workers, um, so they drive in the big transport vans to the, the places that they're going to, to do their job. And for four out of the five workers, um, their drivers were falling asleep um, while driving. So I really highlighted the risk to life that they are facing. There's a risk to their life every single day that they're getting in the van and going to work. So I think that that might be why my applications were, um, were all approved so quickly. But even with the one who, who wasn't in that situation, um, hers was also approved very quickly. So um, I feel like there is maybe somebody who's triaging these applications when they're first received. Um, to review the strength of the application, the evidence that's included, and a kind of a preliminary overview of what exactly is going on in the situation. Um, so, um, so yeah, just wanted to mention that um, because the processing times for these applications, like I said, on the website, it says that these applications will be processed very quickly within five business days. Um, and, and of course, that has been my experience. However, I also have spoken to others in that company who either applied for this on their own or they applied through um, an immigration consultant um, and um, months ago and their applications have not yet been um, approved. So it is possible that, that um, these applications could take up to the standard amount of processing for a change in work conditions, which is, could be up to four or five months. Um, so um, yeah, in terms of my tips for getting a quick, a quick result and a successful result. Um, so in my work, I have described in a lot of detail the full circumstances surrounding the application. So I have discussed everything that the workers have experienced from the time that they signed their contracts in Peru and even maybe slightly before that. Um, <clears throat> so um, even, you know, the circumstances surrounding the signing of their contracts in their home country, um, I think establish um, an example of how, um, you know, the, the owners of the corporation were intending to exploit the workers um, for my clients. Like they never received a copy of the contract they signed. The contracts were all in English. None of them spoke much English. They didn't have the opportunity to take the contract away, to have it uh, translated. Um, and they were, like I said, never provided with a copy. So um, 
so yeah, just really discussing, um, like I say, like in, in great detail, as much detail as, as you can, or the worker can, the full context that they are, are um, experiencing. Um, so I just reproduced um, their section 207.1 sub 1 of the, um, I, the IRP regulations that Francie also highlighted. Um, so it states um, a work permit may be issued under section 200 to a foreign national in Canada if there are reasonable grounds to believe that the foreign national is experiencing risk or is at risk of, exp or of experiencing abuse uh, in the context of their employment in Canada. So a few things to note here, the standard that you have to meet, the standard of reasonable grounds to believe. So it's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, it's, uh, it's more of a balance of probability. So 50% plus one that the worker is experiencing um, abuse. Um, and as Francie pointed out, it's abuse or risk of abuse. So if others in their work community have experienced um, for example, like inadequate access to health care or um, a lack of um, uh, care when it comes to COVID um, or patterns of sexual abuse. Um, those are, you know, things that your client doesn't have to experience themselves. They just have to show how they are at risk of also experiencing that. Um, and as I said, it's really helpful to demonstrate a pattern of abuse in the company um, that remains unchanged despite attempts to address problems in the past. Now, of course, in, for, for all of my clients, this was their situation. Some of the clients that I connected with had been working for years with this employer. Um, some were like eight years off and on. Some of them had just arrived um, a year and a half ago. Um, but regardless of when they arrived, it's just, I think, helpful to demonstrate to IRCC that these are patterns of abuse that are unlikely to change, that are entrenched in the culture of the company. Um, and, um, and, you know, of course, workers, if they have tried to address anything, any issue with their supervisor or the owner of the company, you know, you'll, you'll want to talk about that in your affidavit. Um, but if they haven't, that's also fine. You can explain why not because of the fear, because of the threat of punishment, because of the abuse and how other workers have been treated when they've spoken up. Um, so all of that is, is important to discuss. Um, in my applications, I always used an affidavit. Um, I mean, typically, um, my affidavits have been between 13 and 16 pages long. Um, but I mean, this was my first I experience doing it. I was very thorough. But of course, those affidavits did take a lot of time to prepare. Um, but I have been successful and it's only taken a week. So I mean, it's hard for me to, to weigh in, you know, what's required, what's necessary, what's better. All I know is what I did and that I was successful um, and very quickly. Um, as Francie said, um, including as much relevant supporting evidence as possible, the more the better. Um, so um, I've included photographs, newspaper articles, um, like, for example, about the condition of the apartments that they live in, um, in Kitchener, newspaper articles about um, similar incidents that have happened uh, within the company. Um, it, like, even if they happened many, many years ago, um, the, the incident um, is, you know, was a, a horrific incident that was covered by papers here in, in our area and also newspapers in Toronto. Um, so I always have included those. Um, definitely medical records. If what you're explaining is that the worker has, you know, had injuries, then you want to show that like, yes, that in fact, the worker did have injuries and that, um, that they've, you know, if they've accessed any sort of medical care, trying to get those records and including them. 
uh, with the application has been helpful. Um, certainly, if the worker has gone to the police, uh, to the labor board, to the human rights tribunal, if they filed anything on their own, definitely including that with the application. Um, also, like emails. Um, and then something that I found really helpful to submit is screenshots of texts or Facebook or WhatsApp message or uh, WhatsApp conversations um, with the worker's family, friends, partners, coworkers, anybody who they've been talking to about the abuse that's happening or about the situations that are happening um, at the time that they were happening. Um, those can go a really long way in supporting, you know, what the, the worker is saying in their affidavit. Um, as Francie said, very important if the worker has filed those complaints to submit them. In the situation, so in for all of my workers, none of them had submitted any of these kinds of claims. They're very isolated. They're the owner of the company, you know, would tell them things like you're not allowed to socialize with um, people outside of work. And um, they were very cut off from any sort of social services or knowing anything about how anything works in Canada. So none of them had done any of this, had filed any claims. Um, and because, you know, it, the priority is removing the worker from their situation of abuse, um, I would explain in the affidavit and, and speak to the worker um, about, you know, connecting with our employment lawyer so that she can explain to them their options. Um, so what I would do is in the affidavit, I would just, the worker would say that they are going to meet with the employment lawyer to talk about their options. I would speak to the worker about the, the tip line um, and the importance of submitting a tip through the tip line. And so we would just talk about our intention to do all of those things. Um, we hadn't actually done it, but even just by, you know, mentioning that this is what we are going to do, I think that was perhaps helpful in um, getting our applications approved very quickly. Um, the last thing about evidence, I would say if you, if you can't provide evidence on an important issue, then explain why you cannot provide it. Um, so as I said, one of the issues was um, the drivers falling asleep uh, while they're driving. Um, but it's very difficult to provide evidence of that because, um, you know, a lot of the driving is happening at night, so it's dark, um, or the workers are all sitting behind the driver, so it's really, the angles are really awkward, and you can't really take a picture from the back seat of the, the driver falling asleep. Um, so I think with my first application, my client had forwarded me a video of the driver like doing the head bob and um, so I would I took some screenshots from the video and uploaded those um, as proof but for the other workers I didn't have that kind of evidence so I would just explain you know unfortunately we don't have evidence of this but um, and this is why because it was always dark because the angle was too awkward um, so um, that's just my tip on that point um, as Francie said, discussing anything related to COVID-19 is very important. Um, anything from proper social distancing while they're working um, or during the transportation or in the employer-provided housing um, information, you know, these are just kind of things to ask your client when you're first meeting with them about their experience in their workplace, things that you can add to the application. So access to vaccines, did they get time off to get vaccinated, did their employer arrange with public health for the, um, for public health to come uh, to their place of employment to do the vaccinations, um, if not, like, yeah, did they get the appropriate time off um, to go get vaccinated, um, and then again, like, has the employer provided proper PPE, hand sanitizer, do they have policies and protocols did the, did the workers ever receive any information related to COVID? Um, and if not, just mentioning that. Uh, <clears throat> lastly, um, I guess once the application has been submitted, um, 
I mean, again, like I said, mine were approved very quickly, but, um, you know, once I, I send off the affidavit um, and connect my client with our employment lawyer, she would read that, she would write her letter of support, and then I would, I can upload that through the online form. So just you can provide updates if anything changes, or you say, we're submitting this and we're waiting on information, we'll provide it when we receive it. Once you do receive that information, then you can upload it through the web form. Um, I guess the last thing, because I realize that my time <laughs> is uh, is probably gone over, um, is that, um, so as a lawyer, um, my job is to submit that open work permit application. In reality, my clients need so much more than that. They need so much, they need a lot of support transitioning out of this isolated situation into new housing, new job, um, just changing their address with the CRA, filing their EI application. Um, so definitely want to connect your clients with as many resources and people who can support them in the aftermath of the application as possible. Um, I mean, my dream is that we would have a Spanish speaking social worker in house to help um, my clients do all of this after after stuff. Um, we don't. Um, so a lot of it has fallen on me and it has been very draining um, and exhausting to do all of that because I still have to do all of my other legal work. And this has been um, a very difficult year for me personally. Um, so final thoughts are remembering that your clients are all survivors of abuse and they need to be in control of the process. You can explain to them the importance of taking certain steps, um, but ultimately it's up to your client whether they do want to take that step or not. Um, and sometimes their priorities are going to shift after the application is approved. Um, so for example, you can explain to them the importance of filing with the Ministry of Labor or submitting a tip with the tip line. Um, but they may not want to do that after their application is approved. Um, and, um, and that's their call. It is not our call. Um, and just applicants need a lot of support. So um, thanks. That's, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, there was a lot of fantastic information in there. Um, and uh, that's a terrible story, but it's good to hear that the um, applications in that uh, story about the driver falling asleep went through. So thank you so much for, for all that you've offered here. Um, we are going to move along to uh, Eliza from the Cooper Institute. Uh, and Brian as well, if he has anything to offer. Uh, they're partners in the uh, Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Program um, and have been for since the beginning. So uh, thank you so much for agreeing to speak and we'd love to hear about your experiences in supporting workers with this uh, in uh, open work permit applications. So thank you. Great, thank you, David. Um, so yeah, Ryan and I are with the Cooper Institute in Prince Edward Island, uh, and we support uh, migrant workers here. Um, we have had kind of limited experience going through the actual process, um, but we're going to just uh, chat about um, those two experiences we've had. I'm going to talk about an experience where we had success and even the challenges that came with the success. Uh, and Ryan's going to highlight a case where we didn't have success um, and, you know, further challenges that came with that. Um, I think just also mentioning, you know, uh, Rachel mentioned this in her presentation also that um, there is just a lot of hesitation among workers around applying for this because it does come with a lot of risk. And so we've spoken with um, quite a few workers about uh, this opportunity, like the open work permit um, kind of program and the potential of applying for it. And even folks that we know are in situations of abuse, they've communicated that to us clearly, um, but they're still very hesitant to apply understandably because of the risks that are associated. Um, and also just kind of what that would mean for kind of their, the community back home. And, um, you know, also if the, you know, they have debts, um, what that could mean. So, Kind of just highlighting that, you know, we have had just two workers that have actually gone through the process, but we have spoken with quite a few more about it. 
um, and really just the kind of fear of that, that unknown, especially when we can't guarantee that, um, that they are, will get this open work permit. Um, so that's just uh, kind of one piece to highlight. Um, so with the uh, open work permit process that we went through where we did have success, um, it did take a considerable amount of effort. So um, myself and my coworker, along with a neighbor uh, who spoke Spanish um, and the FCJ Refugee Center in Ontario, um, all supported us with this worker. Um, so there was a lot of kind of upfront work on that end. Um, after though, we got a quick time turnaround, thankfully. So it was about five days also, and, and that uh, has been uh, the case for both situations. Um, but afterwards, just the amount of work that was required then to kind of support um, this person finding a new job, um, they had, uh, they don't have any English skills, so um, there was kind of a lot of support given from ourselves, as well as the neighbor, um, in searching for another job. Uh, additionally, um, you know, we, thankfully, we were able to find jobs that this worker um, could do and was interested in. However, things that came up then were around housing and transportation. A lot of the jobs were in rural areas in PI and um, housing and transportation just aren't available. So that really hindered kind of what opportunities there were. Um, also looking at, because of open work permit that this worker received was for one year, um, just kind of the concern of what happens after one year uh, when they are then kind of forced to you know, go back into a closed work permit. Um, and so we did consider that quite a bit and brought that kind of allowed the worker kind of decide, do you want to, you know, go with this job that we did find that, um, you know, they, we already know they won't be able to get a, a labor market impact assessment um, at the end of the year. And then we'll have to start fresh there. Or should we go with this job that, you know, does have that labor market impact assessment? We know they can get it and have it in the past. And there are other migrant workers there. Um, in the end, this person did choose to go with the job that has a labor market impact assessment. Um, however, what we're seeing now is um, it was a, a six month seasonal job, which is common here. Um, but because of that, the worker does want to kind of continue to work after with the um, remaining six months of their open work permit. Uh, and that has now put their current job in jeopardy of being asked back. Um, just because the current employer doesn't perceive them anymore as loyal um, to them. And, and so this, it has put the worker in an uncomfortable situation where they're now potentially having to go find a new start fresh after the six months, even though we had, you know, kind of set up something that, that was hopefully going to work. So I think just, you know, for workers to be going in and out of um, the, like the close to the open to the close can be really complicated for them. Um, and just, you know, doesn't really allow them much mobility and leaves them still in vulnerable situations. Um, so that's the case that we actually had success with, but just kind of highlighting some of the challenges. And then Ryan's going to chat about the case we didn't. Yeah, so I think that uh, I already shared a lot of the story on one of our previous calls. Um, but a worker uh, was in touch with us, um, looking, uh, who was experiencing these to the workplace. Uh, so whenever we mentioned the open work permit, um, it turns out that this individual uh, mentioned to us that they already applied. Um, so their application, they followed everything, the information they had on the website. Um, and to clarify their application, IRCC did call them. Um, so that either that call either took place at their place of employment or at the accommodation provided to them through the employer, um, which is potentially a dangerous thing to, to have happen. Um, but I think that the fact that their first application was denied kind of speaks to some of the huge barriers with this program. Um, first, you know, the language barrier is huge, right? This is only offered in English and French. Um, thankfully, this worker is fluent in English. Um, but I know with like, uh, in particular, the seasonal agriculture worker program, um, the Mexican uh, embassy put out some information about that last year and just kind of said that, you know, the vast majority of individuals going through this program uh, are not fluent in either of those two languages and also that like 42 percent of them only have primary education or or less than that uh, which means you know a lot of these systems aren't really designed for them to navigate easily um, and also just like the the, the technological requirements right like laptops uh, a lot of folks we work with uh, sometimes don't have laptops or access to laptops right 
Um, and I think the biggest one that we've kind of seen is the, just the labor power. And I'm sure a lot of you folks know too, it's the labor power. It took like three of us about three or four full days to go through one of these applications, right? Um, and, and, and a lawyer as well, but even whenever we were doing that, right, like we found ourselves at a point where we're on YouTube trying to find tutorials about what options to select, right? Like it, they're, they're not accessible by any means for, for workers, um, or, you know, organizations supporting them. Um, unfortunately, as a lot of you already know, this worker was denied the, uh, open work permit uh, upon our second application. Um, they were told that they were not able to demonstrate that they were experiencing abuse, even though uh, I believe France, you did give kind of the qualifications there of the four types of abuse they can experience. We very much highlighted uh, two or three of those um, through, uh, you know, an affidavit, a uh, letter from us, a letter from them, uh, that we went through the online reporting tool. Um, we supplied text messages, uh, photo evidence, um, and it was still denied. Um, so that's like, that didn't really make too much sense to us. And I know, also know from like the report um, that was sent out last week, like a lot of times uh, it was saying that like service providers uh, in the province have to talk to the federal government about like some of the regulations in the province. So for instance, in PEI, there's quarantine laws, a mandatory quarantine of two weeks. Um, this individual was working during that, they were told to work. Um, but, you know, like maybe sometimes there's a little bit of a, a lack of information sharing there or service providers have to kind of tell the IRCC about the standards in that province. Um, so back on that reporting tool, I, I've already shared a bit of this, so I don't want to go too, too much into it. But um, basically, because we submitted that complaint, although the work permit was denied by IRCC, uh, ESDC decided to send somebody to do an inspection at the workplace. Um, which was, you know, in a workplace very small, it's pretty easy for the employer to kind of figure out uh, who did that. Um, and it led to a situation where this worker uh, was messaging individuals saying that they feared for their life um, and led to an emergency kind of evacuation for this worker. And we're now in the process of trying to find that worker in a new employment and a place to stay. Um, and that's kind of been ongoing. Um, but I think that really what this kind of does is it, it reflects that like given like the nature of the temporary foreign worker program, um, like there's kind of like an inherent power dynamic between the employer and, and the actual workers. And, and from our kind of reading of this, you know, and, and from the previous presentation too, it's like kind of like we feel as though any worker should really be eligible for these open work permits whenever you see, you know, just the nature of how this program operates. Um, and, you know, this program itself is just very inaccessible uh, for there's a like, huge amount of barriers for people to access it, but there's also a, a large amount of negligence um, from IRCC and ESDC that, you know, needs to be addressed. So it's really, really unfortunate that uh, neither of them could be here today. Um, we're pretty disappointed in that, but uh, very uh, thankful and hopeful that uh, Kairos can kind of read this information over to them. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, we're definitely uh, going to um, bring as much of this information as we can forward to um, IRCC, because I think it is important that they understand not just <laughs> like in the running of the program, it's important that they um, know how it's experienced practically um, and experiences on the ground as everybody's mentioned, it is, it is an effort um, to go through the process itself. Um, and uh, in the application process, uh, like as you described, um, it's sort of two agencies within the government working against each other um, to the detriment of the workers. So I think that's important to raise up to um, uh, as a practical issue within the program. Um, oh, so we're going to move on to uh, Vilma. I saw that the worker unfortunately has uh, run out of data and my apologies for um, for the uh, scheduling of this. I should have uh, been more considerate. So all apologies, but uh, Vilma, would you still be uh, able to talk a bit about your experiences. Uh, Vilma, I got one from uh, Tiano. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so 
Uh, when we started the uh, empowerment of uh, for migrant workers sometime in February, well, we saw a lot of abuse from the migrant workers, not just from the caregiver community, but as well as from the farm workers that we visited uh, in Ontario. And because of this project, um, uh, we were able to help a lot of uh, migrant workers uh, experiencing uh, abuse and most of them are really uh, scared uh, to file a complaint against the employer because uh, first, most of them uh, were not um, educated uh, on about the rights of the migrant workers. So when we started doing uh, uh, visit, uh, visitations to different farms, uh, we started uh, doing uh, a lot of workshops and give them uh, information about the rights and and because of that, uh, most of the workers are now coming out and uh, started to uh, contact us, especially the neighborhood organization, uh, to file a complaint. And I have uh, I filed 20 uh, last summer, 20 cases and uh, for open work permit for vulnerable. And only I'm still waiting for some uh, approvals. Uh, just like uh, one of the workers who just left because his data is uh, has run out. So uh, I'm still waiting for his approval. And last night I also up, uh, uploaded two applications. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not licensed, but uh, I'm helping clients and because uh, there is a gap in, uh, you know, they, could, they, they cannot go to a legal clinic because legal clinic closes after four or five and they're working. <clears throat> from uh, sun up to sundown. So <clears throat> the only way they can uh, connect with us is through TNO and my schedule is always uh, um, uh, um, at night because, uh, because workers, uh, they can contact me during after five o'clock. So most of the time I am up uh, after five o'clock because that's when I get a lot of calls from workers. And this program really helps and saves a lot of uh, workers from the, um, uh, from the environment, from the abusive environment. And I'm so happy to let you know that uh, most of the workers that I applied for, they're now happy and working uh, with benefits and with overtime pay somewhere else. And I have one worker who was beaten. Uh, we, we went to the farm and he was there and he has so much black eye and bruises all over his body. He was beaten by uh, co-workers and he is, he is living in the uh, bank house of the employer. And that was Friday night. And then he filed a complaint to the police and then the employer came and the employer said that uh, I already bought a ticket for you for Monday morning. So I said, do you want to leave? He said, no, okay, if you don't want to leave, you have to go to the police station where you filed the complaint, get the police a report, go to the hospital, uh, have the doctor check you out and then take the medical report and then leave the employer's place, uh, go somewhere else. You know what happened? Because he only have a car, a small rental car. He slept in his car. And then we... Uh, we uploaded this application. We did this application over the weekends. I was up like two nights. And so we uploaded and then we finished uh, Sunday early in the morning. I uploaded it in uh, IRCC website. And then uh, I said, we have to wait, but don't go, don't leave the country because we already have the application. And to our surprise, his application was approved within 48 hours. And he's now in Toronto working and he has an open work permit. Also, I have clients, um, they are from the seasonal worker from Jamaica and also from Philippines. And so because the open work at uh, the temporary, the TR to PR uh, public policy uh, has been uh, um, announced so that temporary foreign workers under the uh, SAWP uh, was able to apply for the uh, PR application for this TR to PR and these uh, workers, uh, don't need to go back to Jamaica because they have now an open work permit and is and they are waiting for the approval of the PR. Actually, they already received a um, acknowledgement of receipt that IRCC is now uh, 
uh, almost in the final stage. So when uh, IRCC send letter for uh, biometrics and medical, meaning that their application is uh, ongoing and uh, almost in the finish line. So I'm really happy for this program and I'm really happy for the Open Work Permit for Vulnerable um, program, but I think that the government should uh, give some leniency so workers can access and apply for the program because uh, if clients come to me, 20 clients will come to me, at least only two I can I can apply for open work permit because they're not they're scared to, to file a complaint against the employer. I think that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much for for your contributions. Um, so we're going to uh, open it up into discussion. Uh, as we enter into this discussion and Q&A, um, I'd like to remind you to keep yourselves muted until you're called upon. You can use the raise hand function to queue to ask questions, or uh, again, you can put questions in the chat uh, and we can uh, shift them into the, uh, or I'll read them into the, uh, the chat. So uh, as we open the floor, uh, we'll start with uh, Roland. You're muted, Roland. Uh, good, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's lunchtime now here in Atlantic Canada. So I have a question. I think we have some lawyers that have even experienced uh, settlement organization that could answer this question. So I have a client that uh, uh, he has been uh, promoted. Uh, he came here as a shift manager to one of the restaurant here. And uh, after a couple of weeks, a, a couple of months, he got promoted into a, an assistant uh, store manager, a restaurant manager. And after, without changing the LMIA. So after a couple of more months, he prom got promoted to a restaurant manager. And I think he worked there for about six months and suddenly he was demoted to a shift manager again. And then he was, he was uh, threatened that if he, if he don't sign the contract to become shift manager again, that, uh, that his, his family will be, will be deported to the Philippines. So we tried to, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we already made a, 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 a complaint at our employment standard in New Brunswick. But uh, we were told that we don't have sufficient um, sufficient uh, evidence. So because we, we didn't he didn't record it, but he technically uh, you know uh, he technically uh, signed the contract already that uh, he be working as a shift manager when he came over here. So would that be uh, uh, what would be uh, you guys a uh, recommendation in order for us to produce an evidence to uh, in order to proceed with uh, his. Uh, his application. We haven't filed anything at the, you know, at the federal level, because we're wondering that we, we need to provide first the evidence in here, even from the province, if we can get something from the province that telling us that they violated the employment standard that we could go up and uh, apply for a permit for Bernal Labor uh, employee. He appreciate any any thought that you guys could uh, share with us or direct us in the uh, right uh, resources or direction that uh, would be good for us. Thank you. Uh, hi, it's Rachel here. Um, I guess I would probably recommend maybe connecting with an employment lawyer um, who would be able to write you an opinion letter about how the employer is violating the worker's rights. Okay. Um, and using that, and I mean the fact that you submitted the the claim with employment standards; those are both indications that these things actually happened. Uh, and so, um, in fact, he emailed me. He cannot sleep. He already have he already have a certificate from the doctor for a four weeks uh, uh, day off or stress leave. So he already filed a claim claim to EI, but, you know, still in process, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, so. So, yeah, uh, I would include that medical evidence as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and also if the doctor, yeah, I mean, if the doctor can, can write a supportive letter uh, as well, um, or, and if your client can access any free counseling services um, yeah. and get a, you know, just okay. evidence of, of support that they're accessing in the community. And then like, it would be helpful to like write a narrative that tears yeah. ties that all together. It he has a very long narrative. That's why, you know, we are almost ready for, for that, uh, that we're just waiting uh, for another letter because when, when the employment standard wrote to us, he said that the, the motion is an internal for the company. So they basically, we accept that, we, they, that they can, you know, they can promote, demote, even without working permit. So without, without I know that when he, when he changed, when he came to, to, uh, to, to New Brunswick, he has a shift manager position. So his LMIA is a uh, ship manager and then he become assistant manager without changing the LMIA. And then when he become a, a store manager, two weeks, two months from that, that's the time that he changed the, the LMIA to a uh, to supervisor, to store manager. And then it, when it lowers down to ship manager again, they didn't give me another uh, LMIA. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to see. You know, there's, there's a problem in that. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, our, our employment standard is specifically say that, that you know no no employer can threaten you or set, or even a, a, a bit, a bit, you know uh, even uh, allow you to uh, to deport uh, an employee. So we're waiting for that decision because they said we, we don't care about the demotion right now. Yeah. The only thing we care is the you know threatening to deport uh, him in in his family. It causes a lot of grief and stress on his family. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, so certainly um, violations uh, of the law in other areas are important to talk about. Um, one of the examples I offered in with my applications is that um, the employer increased their rent uh, without any warning or any discussion. It just happened and they all noticed one day. Um, but for example, in Ontario this year, um, um, no one is allowed to raise the rent. There's a rent, cre uh, rent freeze across the province. Um, so that's something I mentioned as well as an example of financial abuse. So however, you can characterize it to fit into those categories, the IRCC list, so that's gonna be helpful. I'm gonna take uh, Francie's comment on, if it's on this, and then we're gonna to move to SL for the next question. Yeah, I agree with Rachel, and yeah, I would like to recommend Roland uh, just to, for me in my experience, um, it works uh, just the handwriting of the worker and the witnesses. Why? Because uh, the declaration or the statement of the um, abused worker comes is the is the biggest proof is you you are experienced the abuse. So if you maybe the affidavit is better. Uh, also the handwriting of the worker, witness testimonies, writing handwriting or affidavit attached. Uh, for about the employment, uh, anything that you have coming from the employment, because sometimes it's not easy to identify the issue. For for example, uh, if you don't have the contract, you need the contract <laughs> because everything is based on the contract. So we need the co you will need the contract. Any warning to the worker, any email that they didn't reply, the human resources didn't reply. It works. I mean, everything you can attach as a proof is better for, by my in my opinion, the affidavit would be perfect. And all the recommendations that Rachel also take to Roland, it works. Thank you so much. Um, all right, Esso, you can go ahead. Hi again, everyone. So my question is specific to Rachel and um, Francie. Um, so this is not specific to um, the uh, open work permit, but in general access to uh, immigration lawyers. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if um, both of your legal clinics have um, the capacity to uh, do uh, accept clients um, from um, pro other provinces, especially those uh, with legal clinics that don't have immigration lawyers. Um, trying to handle um, any immigration-related uh, services for migrant workers? Um, unfortunately, um, no, and even within... Oh, Albert, if you could mute yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, no, um, definitely not from out of province, even within the province, like our funding is dependent, like every um, community legal clinic has a geographic catchment area or an, an issue specific. Um, and I only practice, started practicing immigration law about two years ago. It was just something that like, it was a clear need in our community. Um, and so I just started learning to be able to practice it myself. We've since hired a full-time immigration lawyer, um, but no, definitely not out of province. And even for our clinic, even out of catchment area is, is pretty much a no, only because of our funding and also my capacity. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, the same is similar. Yeah, we are we are in a click system. Uh, we only are. Um, I mean, our caching area is just limited in our case for Windsor and Essex County. However, because we are a clinic system, we are able to su to support the other clinics in the other regions. So uh, now, for example, we are supporting the Grace Blues Clinic, um, legal clinic. Uh, in any issues they can deal with because they don't have too many cases in immigration or employment law or something like that about minor workers. So as a clinic, we will be able to assist any other clinics or uh, help them with um, any issues to deal with the issues or just give an advice or just a recommendation or guide the legal clinic if they want to start uh, just doing applications for migrant workers. So yeah, I think we are open to, to help any, any clinic in the regions, but yeah, we are limited to our geographical yeah. area of services. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question from Mike. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was just wondering, I, I know that there's certain farms in the area that uh, there are issues um, but there, the amount of workers is, is quite large. Like we're talking hundreds of workers, um, in a situation like that, uh, I feel like it would be difficult, uh, if everybody at once decided that they wanted to leave that employer because the conditions were so bad, I, I just, it seems like a, a huge barrier because of, you know, the lack of ability to handle that, that large of a caseload, just say like, you know, several hundred workers at once wanted to uh, leave that farm and have an open work permit. Uh, how would we even be able to handle that kind of workload? Um, it just seems like, you know, it's okay in, in cases where there's just a few a few workers, but what if everybody decided, you know, what if they were educated on on the open work permit program and they all were like, yes, this farm is terrible. We, we all want to leave. Um, you know, are there any ideas of how we could handle such a such a large amount? Yes, uh, Francie, you can go ahead. Yeah, I had the same situation here in in in, in our area. A bunch of workers, they didn't want just to leave because they are abusing the workplace and they approach us, we want to file a group complaint and say, no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, just any situation is a particular, any individual has different experience of the abuse. So uh, it's not easy. Um, what I mentioned is each worker has to file their own application, provide their own evidence, uh, the evidence of one worker will be different to the other evidence of the other worker. I had a video, another one no, doesn't have a video. I had a um, text message, the other one doesn't have a text message. It depends on the situation. But uh, I know there is a, a massive uh, workers experience the same abuse, but each application has to file separately, independently, one of the other, and be supported with good evidence. And uh, depends on the discretion of the officer, if it's enough merit, or they consider enough merit to uh, approve an application of a work, work permit. That means it's just a, it's just like um, have merits on the application and wait for the immigration officer decision. Uh, not all the cases are resolved at the same way. Just depends on the, um, the merit of the application and depends on the discretion of the immigration officer to decide all the complaints. So step by step, a one by one application will be better. Uh, 
sometimes if the worker just didn't experience like, directly the situation, the abuse situation, uh, it's not easy that be successful in the application. But if the other worker is the experienced worker who has who was victim of the abuse, it's going to be successful. So it depends on any any of the workers and the evidence they can show up to the application. Well, I, I under the uh, the guidelines there, it kind it stated that if a worker is at risk of abuse, so if there's a, a pattern, um, then they might be able to use other evidence, just you know, supporting evidence to say, well, this is happening. It's not happening to me but I am at risk of abuse because of the way the employer treats other employees at the, at, you know, at the farm or whatever. So would they not be able to use other evidence, uh, you know, to support that they are at risk of abuse, not di directly experiencing it? Um, how often, how often do people use that, um, you know, to be, to, to get an open work permit? Do you find that people are using, other evidence of somebody else, or is it more, is it usually just direct abuse? They're no, experiencing it, abuse directly. It, uh, it can be directly or indirectly. So what, why, when I do my cases, I use the indirectly uh, evidence from the other workers as a witness, as you know, the witness testimony of the other co-workers helps. If you don't experience it directly, you can see an in, in a risk of abuse because my co-worker, Pedro, uh, was hidden by the employer or um, uh, we all, all, of, all of us, we went treated by the employer. In a, I had a video and in the video, he's treating all of us. So, you know, any evidence, witness testimonies can be held if it's directly or indirectly. So it depends how how you well support your application and convince the immigration officer that is a risk, a situation, or is a direct or indirect abuse. Yeah, so, yes, this is what, what I want to say. To you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna move to Connie. Uh, actually, David, is it okay if we go uh, to Stacy and Aswani yeah. first? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to Stacy first, um, just because we haven't heard from her this session, uh, and then we'll come to Azwani afterwards. Thank you. I have kind of a practical question. Um, we're in touch with a worker uh, who was in Nova Scotia, is now in Ontario, uh, is interested to file, uh, well, to apply for the vulnerable worker open work permit. How would we know who direct direct them to? <laughs> um, in terms of a legal clinic um, that provides this kind of support? Um, you're in Toronto? They are in Toronto, but uh, they might be in Scarborough. They might be, you know, in yeah, so the greater you GTA. On, <clears throat> if you just go on Legal Aid Ontario's website, or if you just Google find my community legal clinic, um, then it'll take you to the Legal Aid Ontario website and you put in your postal code and it'll tell you who which legal clinic in the province is for that person's address. And that legal clinic may or may not have an immigration lawyer, but if they don't have an immigration lawyer, they can probably refer you to another legal clinic who does or give you some ideas and appropriate referrals. Okay, thank you. And in the chat, um, Claudio has included that the Community Legal Clinic of York Region in Ontario can assist workers in the York Region, of which uh, Scarborough of Toronto would be part. Uh, all right, so uh, Iswani. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, so I'm just trying to um, understand, and maybe this is more like for Francie, because the majority of workers that I work with they are from Mexico. So they come through the SAP program. So it seems that it's a bit different between the other programs. So it's a temporary farm uh, worker program and it's a temporary well, it's foreign worker program, right? So there are two different programs. And it seems that it's a bit different because with the temporary farm worker programs, um, they seem, first of all, it's more difficult for them because if the, 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 the term or the contract is just uh, eight months maximum. So then they seem to be more um, 
uh, for, uh, more like, uh, how do you say, locked to that employer. I have had cases that they are not going to file, not because they are not super abuse, but because they would not like to file. It's because they say, I've been working like in this farm for 10, 20 years. And if I say something, I'm going to lose even my pension or all these, these opportunities that I have. So, uh, or I'm not going to be rehired because it's the same employer that is rehiring this uh, worker every year. So this seems a bit uh, more complicated for that uh, specific program uh, for those workers that are in the SAP program uh, than in the other like two-year program. So, uh, and I also understand and um, this open work permit program for vulnerable workers is pretty new. So in the terms of uh, they don't know like if there is an uh, opportunity to come back even just to apply in the, in the program, even though just to get in the system when they go back to Mexico and they had to apply to the worker labor, um, they, they, it seems that they, they are having a bit of hard time. I mean, it's nothing to be for sure now, but I don't know if you have heard anything like that or that's, that's one thing. The other thing is like, I just honestly feel like it's just a band-aid band for, for, for workers, for vulnerable workers. It seems very difficult to access, like you said, Rachel, without the uh, proper support of like a settlement worker to help them with housing, finding new work, uh, a new world with LMI. Um, it seems very, very difficult to navigate. And also when they are going to apply for a new work, uh, the new work, the new job is asking for reference. They are asking for um experience but they cannot provide if they have worked in a farm and they have experience with uh, in, in something specific they cannot provide that because then um it's going to be like a red flag to the new employer like okay you left because yes, you said that you were abused but maybe no and then sometimes it seems that workers don't, don't want i mean employers don't want to get into that difficult situations i don't know um your comments on this Anyone? Can I comment on to? that, please? Uh, sure. Yeah, because uh, last uh, week, the uh, last two weekends, we were there in uh, Limington with Jennifer and uh, the rest of TNO's um, uh, team. And uh, we noticed that so many uh, migrant workers coming from Spanish speaking countries. And we visited one of the farms, and there's four, only four. Jamaican workers and then we we presented the, uh, a video we presented you know the rights of the workers and so on and so forth and then we asked and I said that uh, um, uh, how come there's only four Jamaicans uh, in this uh, farm workers because last uh, summer we went to this farm and there's more Jamaican compared to uh, Mexican and they said because the workers uh, before us they complained and then when they came back to Jamaica, the government did not recall them because the factor, the, the, the owner of the farm reported them or oh, these workers, uh, they made a complaint. And so we're not going to get any of your workers anymore. We're going to get workers from Mexico because Mexico, they don't complain. So another issue is that even in the Philippine community, um, there was an advisory from the uh, Philippine consulate and the uh, Polo uh, Philippine Overseas Labor of Employment, they made this advisory that uh, it came to their attention that there's so many uh, Filipino workers applied for open work permit because they are abused and they were, uh, um, uh, they got the approval of the work permit. And then because of that, when they visited these farms, the employers uh, reported it to the Philippine consulate or the polo. And then they made this advisory that uh, the worker should not do this because it affects the image of the Filipino workers. And I said, really, you are more of the image rather than saving the lives of these abused workers. You know, so these are the issues that uh, I, we saw during our visits. And this coming weekend, we will be there again because uh, there's so many workers coming and uh, going out and then coming in. Thank you for that. Um, Connie or Francie, who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no, we'll go to, yeah, go ahead, Francie. I, I don't know, well, it's 20 years ago. <laughs> um, 
Okay, for Aswani, I, I want to say uh, it's, dif it's difficult, I know, um, to try to be successful in an open world permit for vulnerable workers. It's not easy to get, you know, the much evidence that immigration officer wants to see, but uh, fortunately, we have been very successful with the applications. Um, the time, you say that the SOAP workers, the seasonal agricultural workers program, the workers, they had a short time, so they are, they don't want to file an application because it's a short time, because the reprisals from the employer or something like that. But you know, the application, this application is very short. That's mean, as just try to get the, the evidence that you have, most evidence that you have, uh, support well the application, and you, the answer will be in one week, maximum two weeks. It's very fast. Uh, if, if the immigration officer uh, wants more information, contact uh, the, uh, he contact the worker. Usually they contact the worker and say, oh, give me more information about the employment. Give me, uh, just clarify this situation or something like that. So, you know, it's very, very easy. Uh, I had a lot of workers from the SOAP program that successful with the application because it's so fast. That means as soon as just you get the evidence, gather up the evidence, uh, support, file your, your documents and there's um, an application online and that's it. And just wait one week. If you are not successful, try another way. Or maybe I didn't know. That means everybody when, when file an application notice what are the weaknesses and what are the, the strengths of the application. It had merit, maybe I failed, maybe I need to support more, maybe I need to bring another affidavit, maybe I can attach this one or someone. So just apply again. Why? Because it's a short time to decide. So there are many options. This is a very good uh, uh, option for workers. And I know it's difficult to get a, a successful answer, but it's easy to apply many times and get the answer. It's my advice. And for um, Vilma, Vilma was mentioned about, um, I forgot what I say, Vilma. Vilma, you say about, um, let me recall my mind. The, um... In terms of the Philippine consulate. Oh, the Philippines yep. in limit. Yeah. Um, usually, is they didn't, that means you say there are many Jamaicans now than before uh, because the government refused and something like that. And they, and then I think you say because uh, they complain. But I think the immigration officer doesn't have in mind. If complain or not complain, this is just the criteria, the criteria to decide, uh, apply, I mean, to approve or not uh, an open work permit for vulnerable workers. So that's a matter, that's mean, it's not, they don't have in consideration if more Jamaican, Jamaicans apply or more Mexicans apply. No, it's just the criteria that the immigration officer has to evaluate uh, any application. So, um, Anybody has the option to, uh, to complain and to understand and exercise their rights in Canada. And the deadline line is showing that. So the government is protecting the workers. The government is saying, if you have to complain, do it anonymously, uh, regardless what your employer say. Usually the employer use this type of tactic to, to say the workers, if you complain, I can just send you home and you don't have the right to complain, but it's not like that. The government is protecting the workers. The government is giving tools to them to apply, to protect the workers. So uh, everybody has right to complain. So they can do it anonymously if they don't want just to reveal the, the part or something like that. Yeah, this is just okay. what I want to say. The government is protecting the, the workers. I'm going to uh, move to uh, Connie. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, so I wanted to uh, get her perspective on this. And then we're going to have to move so into much. wrapping up soon. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Francie. And um, is it Elsa? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the other speaker from Water. Sorry, I wasn't thinking. Um, it's it's there's a lot of you know uh sharing of experiences questions and so forth and as i've said earlier it is unfortunate that we don't have you know the ircc and esdc uh 
people, our representatives uh, to this uh, webinar, but also just to say that uh, there are a number of important issues as well that we, we were not able to touch. For example, when we talk of the open work permit uh, for vulnerable workers, this is very temporary. It is only, you know, valid for one year and it's not renewable. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, that the whole, you know, uh, objective of this work permit is to take away the worker from an abusive situation, an abusive work environment and for the worker to be able to find another uh, employment, another job that is not as abusive and exploitative as his previous uh, employment. So, so you know, uh, when we advise or when we present uh, to the workers this open work permit, we have to be very, very careful to make sure that they understand that this one year, this is non-renewable. Uh, non and for them to be able to come back to the program that they are in, they have to find whether it's LMIA tied work permit or open work permit, they have to find another, a new employer so that when the open work permit expires, they're able to, you know, to renew and uh, apply for the kind of work permit that will allow them to stay in Canada and work more long term. The other thing that, uh, we need to understand is when when we use the tip line, when we encourage workers to use the tip line to complain or to file a complaint or lodge an allegation about the work situation and abuse uh, they are experiencing, uh, we also it does not necessarily that they have to apply for an open work permit. Um, what we what the, uh, the the purpose of the tip line is is to ensure that there is an avenue for the workers to report the situation they are in and there is integrity branch within service canada that makes that inspection and and you know make recommendations to to change the situation now when we uh we we also advise uh the worker whether there is reprisal or whether the worker is being targeted by the employer because of you know of uh, using the tip line, as Francis said, uh, the government uh, assures confidentiality and privacy of the workers who are using the tip line. Of course, there's there's always a leak, and you know uh, we cannot uh, we cannot be sure that that confidentiality is not uh, is not. Um, Reached or something like that. But again, for us, and I think this is very important for all the community partners uh, under this project, we want to make sure that we understand, that we know, you know, uh, and we know what to advise or how to advise or how to support uh, the migrant workers who are coming to us for assistance and for help. Now, we are in partnership and we collaborate with community legal clinics. And one example is the previous community legal clinic and the bilingual uh, legal clinic. We were in Hanover uh, last uh, this weekend and we were able to identify other issues, other concerns that we, we don't know about. So there's, there's continuous edu education for all of us and at the same time learning from the workers. We go back to them and say, we, this is what we find out and this is, you know, the, the options or uh, information that we want to share with you and it is up to you with our help to support whatever decisions, you know, uh, you might want to make. We don't want to make uh, promises that you know we cannot uh, fulfill, particularly when those promises has to do with immigration or government agencies that we don't have control about. What we what we're what we're doing though is we bring to them to their attention the cases that come across our way, and we ask them you know what they can do what they can, you know, what information they can further provide us, our community partners, so that the information that goes out there is accurate. 
The other thing too that I found out is when, for example, a worker in the seasonal agricultural workers program apply for an open work permit, once that work permit is issued automatically, the worker is out of the program. So, so he cannot go back to the program until he gets another employer that brings him back to, uh, to SAP. And similarly, for the two-year uh, uh, agricultural pilot program. So there are those, and I think there is an organization actually that did conduct a study on the open work permit for vulnerable workers, and they found a number of major issues and concerns. And that document was actually shared to our partners, and I think it behooves us to look into that and add our voices in terms of what are the concerns, what are the challenges, you know, we face as faced by the workers and shared with us in, you know, this pathway or this avenue uh, to get workers out of vulnerable and exploitative um, situation. Um, I'm saying this um, just because we, we really wanted to educate ourselves on the limitations, the challenges, the barriers and gaps as well with, you know, the open work permit and also in using the tip line and understanding what the different countries limitations restrictions and policies are when it comes to their workers coming to Canada whether under SAP or under the two-year agricultural pilot program. So I would say there's a lot of learnings to do. Uh, we take it from our experiences with the cases that we handle with the workers that come to our you know for our assistance. And as Francis said, there's no one single answer to all the questions. IRCC, you know, um, makes decision based on the merits of each worker or each application and not, you know, collectively or one, uh, one farm or something like that. So I just wanted to, yeah, to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So we've reached the end of our uh, time here. Um, as mentioned by a few of us, we are going to be carrying um, questions and concerns forward in our discussions with uh, ESGC and um, IRCC. So um, I have save the chat. So I'm going to take some of those questions uh, and collate them and as well as things from the session itself. Um, and I'm going to put my email in the chat if there's anything you think of uh, as the day continues. Um, and you can uh, send uh, further questions and concerns there for us to carry forward. Uh, and also in the chat, I have put in a link to register for the next webinar from the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Program, um, or project, and that is on uh, the airport services uh, that Kairos offers, but uh, also an understanding of the uh, airport services as offered across uh, Canada. So. Thank you so much. Uh, please get in touch uh, about uh, questions and concerns uh, that you want us to carry forward. And thank you so much for your kind attention uh, and participation in this webinar. Thank you so much.